Hi guys, welcome back to Trek Culture. Today, we're gonna to be looking at a 50-50 split of both behind the scenes and in-universe topics. Without any further ado, I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are the 10 greatest second chances in Star Trek. Number 10, Grace Lee Whitney. Grace Lee Whitney, as we know, played yeoman Janice Rand in the first season of Star Trek, the original series. She was clearly being set up to be a main character and then all of a sudden vanished from the screens. This is because a producer behind the scenes basically showed himself to be all of the worst parts of Hollywood, sexually assaulted her and had her fired. Now, this led to her struggling for a while as an actor and eventually settling into an alcohol dependency. She was, however, rediscovered by DeForest Kelly. He encouraged her to start attending the Star Trek conventions, which also then led to her appearing in Star Trek The Motion Picture and Star Trek The Search for Spock, Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, and of course Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, where she is finally a lieutenant commander. Although Grace Lee Whitney has since passed away, at least her legacy in Star Trek was solidified when she returned to the role. The character could have faded away through no fault of her own, but having her come back meant that even now, 50 years later, we remember Yeoman Janice Rand. Number nine, Thomas Riker. Thomas Riker is an example of the road not taken. Created by a transporter accident that effectively duplicated our usual William T. Riker, Thomas Riker was like William T. Riker frozen in a moment of time. When the crew of the Enterprise discover Thomas down on the planet, he is still of the belief that he's in a relationship with Deanna Troy, he is still a lieutenant, you know, he is, he is nine years previously in William T. Riker's life. You might be wondering, Sean, what the heck is he doing here? Because didn't he kind of have a bit of a sticky ending? And yes, yes he did. The reason he's here on this list is because of the aforementioned road not taken. It's, it's something that doesn't always turn up in Star Trek, but when it does, it's a fun example of how to examine some of the decisions we wish we had made and we wish that we'd taken. That, that's a topic that's gonna to come back in this list in particular. Number eight. Tim Russ. Back to behind the scenes, Tim Russ was one of the final contenders for the role of Geordi LaForge when TNG was going into production. Obviously, he didn't get the part because LeVar Burton did. Now, I wouldn't take that away for a second. LeVar Burton is Geordi LaForge. Love him in the role. But thankfully, Russ made such an impact that he was brought back a couple of times. He appeared in the episode Starship Mine as a terrorist. He then appeared as a bridge officer in Star Trek Generations on the Enterprise B. He then, of course, became Lieutenant Commander Tuvok in Voyager. Now, he stayed with Voyager for seven years and has been a vocal proponent of Star Trek in general ever since. He's returned in fan productions and everything. Having Tim Russ join the franchise was, I think, a stroke of pure brilliance, and it all could have gone the other way if the producers hadn't said, maybe, maybe he doesn't suit Geordi LaForge. Maybe let's see what else he can do. Number seven, Ro Laren. She was sort of deposited on the Enterprise by Admiral Kennelly. Now, he had his own reasons for putting her there, so if the above board order of things had continued, it is very likely she would never have regained a Starfleet commission. For the audience, we were delighted Roll Aaron got this second chance, even though we hadn't seen her first one, because she was brought back as a recurring character. A little bit similar to Thomas Riker, officially she had quite a sticky ending. She defected from Starfleet to join the Maquis, but when she did so, we completely bought her reasoning because through her eyes, the Maquis made a lot of sense. Now going on into Deep Space Nine, the Maquis were obliterated by the Dominion and we have yet to see the return of Ro Laren. However, no body, no death, all of those great moments that show Ensign Ro being such a badass, at least they tell me, yeah, she's fine, she's out there. We're gonna see her again. Number six, George Takei, Nichelle Nichols, and Walter Koenig. 
When the original series of Star Trek came to a close, an animated series was then commissioned. And initially, not all of the cast were going to be brought back. Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, James Doohan and Majel Barrett were all, they were all on the payroll fairly quickly. However, Nichelle Nichols, George Takei and Walter Koenig weren't. Leonard Nimoy went to bat saying that he wouldn't return unless George Takei and Nichelle Nichols particularly were brought back. Now, thankfully, you can't really have Star Trek without Spock, which led to Takei and Nichols coming back. That did unfortunately mean that Walter Koenig was left out when it came to the animated series. So he was sort of appeased by being able to write an episode of the animated series. Going on then into Star Trek, the motion picture, boom, they were immediately offered their roles. Chekhov, Sulu and Uhura were all included from the beginning. And in fact, it took Nimoy a little bit longer to agree to sign the dotted line. Going on from there, Uhura has been one of the most influential characters in science fiction media. Walter Koenig is just always great fun and he's led to roles in, of course, Babylon 5, but he's also reprised the role of Chekhov in some fan productions as well. And George Takei is, is George Takei. He's just George Takei. Oh my. Delighted to have them back, but had it not been for Nimoy going to bat for them in the animated series, it's very possible that it would have ended, their fun would have ended with the last season of Star Trek, the original series. Number five, Michael Burnham. She is not responsible for the death of Philippa Giorgio, nor is she responsible for the Federation Klingon war. That's on to Kuvma. However, she did get the blame for those things. As she is sentenced to rot, basically, in a Federation prison colony, she is thrown a lifeline. Now, the fact that it is Gabriel Lorca, who is, spoiler, from the Mirror Universe, is slightly ironic. It takes a bad guy to give a good guy a second chance. She gets to show that she is an incredibly capable officer. Sinica Martin-Green always pretty much knocks it out of the park, and without this second chance, we would not have Star Trek Discovery. Now, I can hear a portion of the audience going, well, we don't want Star Trek Discovery, and it's absolutely fine, because there's another portion of the audience that are like, oh my. Number four, Susanna Thompson, Alice Cree. The Borg Queen is one of the best additions to the Star Trek franchise in terms of villainy. She first appears in Star Trek First Contact, played by Alice Creek, and she owns every second of the movie that she's in. She was the second choice for the role. Susanna Thompson was originally up for it, but she couldn't commit to the film. So when it came then to Star Trek Voyager and the return of the Borg Queen, Susanna Thompson took over the role for Dark Frontier and Unimatrix Zero. That's actually the original first choice taking over. Although Alice Creek did such a good job on it, it was almost jarring to see Susanna Thompson's take on the character. Alice Krieg then returns for Endgame. Both actors got second chances. And because of that, we got two very different and yet iconic interpretations of the Borg Queen. Alice Krieg's one is dripping with sensuality and evil. Whereas Susanna Thompson's is more like a cold professor, completely amoral. Excellent depictions of the same villain. And because this is the Star Trek universe, the fact that they continually explode really doesn't make much difference because either of them could be back at any point. But as I say, it all came down to those initial second chances that both of them got, and we got some bloody good Borg out of it. Number three, Philippa Giorgio. This one's a little bit of a mash together because you have Philippa Giorgio, who is killed in the Battle of the Binary Stars. But you also, of course, have Emperor Philippa Giorgio, who arrives later on in season one. It's really Emperor Giorgio with whom we spend a lot more time. Philippa Giorgio from the Prime Universe is, of course, killed because of a whole mess of events just coming together at the one time. It's pretty horrible. And then she gets eaten. I mean, that's... Oh my. But that could have been the end of it. And Emperor Giorgio, initially quite one dimensional, then develops over the end of season one into season two, and of course season three, where 
She has exited Star Trek Discovery and we'll see what comes of that. Possibly this could be more classified as a behind the scenes one because it's nice, of course, that Michelle Yeoh came back to the screens, but I do actually class this as an in-universe one. Philippa Giorgio, whether Prime or Mirror, two episodes was not enough with this character. This second chance is as much for the audience as it is for the character. Number two, Gates McFadden. Season one of Star Trek The Next Generation was, by all accounts, an absolute cluster from start to finish behind the scenes. A lot of the responsibility for this can be directed at the then executive producer, Morris Hurley. And also, of course, Gene Roddenberry and his lawyer, Leonard Maislish. Uh, I've recommended it before, I'll recommend it again. I cannot stress how much you need to watch Chaos on the Bridge. It depicts what went on in the first two seasons of The Next Generation. Gates McFadden and Morris Hurley really started to clash as the first year went on, to the point where she was fired at the end of the first season. She is, of course, replaced by Diana Maldauer for season two, and Catherine Pulaski takes over as the chief medical officer of the Enterprise D. At the end of season two, Morris Hurley left the show, then so did Diana Maldauer, then Gates McFadden is offered her job back. This is critical because she goes on to appear in the rest of Star Trek The Next Generation and each of the Next Generation era movies. While her role in the movies, I feel, she doesn't get anywhere near enough to do. She has some critically important moments in the next generation, not least the episode where she f candle. Oh my. But she also commands the Enterprise from time to time. It, she is the one responsible for solving many of the issues that go on. And also Gates McFadden herself directed the infamous episode Genesis. So a Star Trek without Gates McFadden in my opinion, would have been a much poorer Star Trek. Number one, Captain Picard. As I've alluded to several times in this list, The Road Less Traveled is completely depicted best in the episode Tapestry. The episode opens with Picard dying because his artificial heart has been destroyed on an away mission. Enter Q. Q then gives Picard the chance to live his life over, missing several critical decisions that lead to him getting the artificial heart, which will lead to him lying on that medical table, dying on the Enterprise D. We see a man struggle with some of these decisions and eventually realize that, no, going back on your own time stream and changing things, that is not always what you want to do with your life. That is not always a good thing. It is some of those decisions that make the whole picture all the better for it, even if it leaves you dying on a table. So Q gives Picard another chance. This time he doesn't change the past. He grows up to be the man that we all know him to be. And of course he's saved. This is Star Trek. You might regret a decision later on, but that doesn't mean it wasn't an important one to make. That's everything for our list today, guys. If you reckon I missed anything either in universe or behind the scenes, you drop it into the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And remember that you can catch us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can catch myself on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Ferrick. Whatever you do until I'm talking to you again, look after yourself, look after your nearest and dearest and live long and prosper. Thanks very much, guys.